West Hill United is a progressive spiritual community where how you live is more important than what you believe. West Hill United is a people, a place, an idea. We are a community living out of a progressive faith, striving to make a positive difference in our own lives, the lives of others, and the world. Join us Sundays at 10.30 a.m. or connect with us at any time. We have two readings this morning. At the end of the readings, we customarily add the phrase, offered as wisdom for the journey. And we invite you to respond with the phrase, may we walk in its light. And this is just an invitation to participate if you wish to do so. Our first reading is from Alice Walker, an American writer whose novels, short stories and poems are noted for their insightful treatment. Her novels, most notably The Color Purple, focus particularly on women. Walker was the eighth child of an African-American sharecroppers. While growing up, she was accidentally blinded in one eye, and her mother gave her a typewriter, allowing her to write instead of doing chores. Taking the Arrow Out of the Heart by Alice Walker. No one escapes the time in life when the arrow of sorrow, of anger, or despair pierces the heart. For many of us, there is the inevitable need to circle the wound. It is often such a surprise to find it there, in us, when we had assumed arrows so painful only landed in the hearts of other people. Some of us spend decades screaming at the archer or at least for longer periods than are good for us. How to take the arrow out of the heart? How to learn to relieve our own pain? That is the question. The second reading is from Carl Sandburg, who was an American poet, biographer, journalist, and editor. He won three Pulitzer Prizes, two for his poetry and one for his biography of Abraham Lincoln. One must find time for oneself. Time is what we spend our lives with. If we are not careful, we find others spending it for us. It is necessary now and then for one to go away by oneself and experience loneliness, to sit on a rock in the forest and to ask, who am I and where have I been? And where am I going? If one is not careful, one allows diversions to take up one's time, the stuff of life. Offered as wisdom for the journey, may we walk in his light. light. So this morning I'm going to undertake a, a role that I am not uh, qualified to undertake, and that's about being an anthropologist um, and inviting us to consider what it means to be the anthropologist of one's own life, uh, what it means to go in and explore and discover and find out things that you didn't know before based on the artifacts that you find uh, lying within. It's a story that I think many of us undertake at periods of time related to ourselves, but we think of it as a science that people who are educated to be anthropologists undertake. So I'm going to bring it uh, into uh, the here and now so that we can um, enjoy that challenge. So what is anthropology? There's, uh, anthro there's social anthropology and cultural anthropology that I'm going to really refer to today. And um, social anthropology, of course, is the exploration of human behavior, of how it is that we uh, engage as individuals within a group, how we engage as individuals ourselves, how our societies uh, have come together, how they organize themselves, uh, the, the behaviors that are consistent across a variety of cultures, regardless of whether there's been any connection with them or not. 
Um, some of you will have watched that play years ago where uh, they, they find, um, they identify that someone in the community is a witch and they, and they burn her. And that whole scapegoating uh, process that takes place uh, in that play is one that takes place across almost every culture uh, that has uh, grown up upon this earth where we find a way to uh, excise the, the evils or the ills that are happening in the community by placing them on an individual or an animal, a sacrificial animal, and uh, ensure that they take all of that ill away. So anthropologists have found those kinds of connections that go across our communities and down through the roots of time. It also explores um, cultures and linguistics as ways of finding out how uh, a culture trans from one area in the world to another because there are little bits and pieces of the language that linger on and so if they do a deep study of that you can find out more about that too. So I'm going to talk about um, perspectives on our lives um, and uh, how though there are basic things in our lives that most of us share uh, that if we were to look into them we could probably tell things about our lives. Uh, the, the, whatever the makeup of our family was, the, uh, whatever the health uh, of the different children in the families were, whatever the genders of the parenting, uh, whatever the approval of uh, those parents within society, their socioeconomic situation, whether or not they were able to find a way out of that or whether their socioeconomic health declined. All of those things can be information for study and we can find out all sorts of things about us. I'm going to, um, when we usually uh, reflect on our lives though, what we do personally is we think about our families, our families of origin, whether we were an only child, who our siblings were, how they affected us, where were we placed, you know, there's that whole, you know, one, two, three, four placement uh, child theories about who you were going to, what you were going to be like based on which, whether you're the first, second, third, fourth, or tenth child, I think they only ever got to four, but um, so where were you in that order and, and how does that affect you? Um, our, your extended family, did you have a, a, a huge extended family that you spent a lot of time with, Mel's family? They have such a lot of interconnections because that whole family has always come together uh, to bring those generations together and to make sure that the individuals within each generation get to know each other. Um, and our, uh, the home that we live in, what's our home, what's the community, and what schools do we go to, uh, how do we engage there, and uh, what was that like? So an anthropologist looking at family stories uh, would help you reflect on the family that you were growing up in, and so I'm going to do that a little bit. Um, I'll try not to bleed all over you, um, but all of our childhood stories have some things that are a little bit peculiar to us and that um, help us understand ourselves as I grow. And you might hear something in mind that makes you go, oh my gosh, I never thought about that. And probably not, but anyway. So while I was growing up, um, in our family, uh, we had, uh, I, there were four children. Uh, we lived, um, we lived uh, in Kingston in a, in a huge house, uh, a great big um, limestone home that my father got for $17,000. Um, and uh, my grandmother, who was an antique dealer, filled with junk that she called antiques. Much of it, you know, was somewhat dangerous to sit on. Um, and a lot of it, a lot of the beautiful things, if you got really close, you could see there was only part of it there or it had a crack or something like that. So, uh, but it looked lovely. It was a big house. And we had uh, on the fourth floor, my, I think I've mentioned this before, my parents took in international students. So we had deep and rich relationships with people who didn't look like us from the time we were infants. Uh, and so that has influenced all of us in our uh, relationships with people who are non-white uh, in the community and beyond. Um, but the world, um, the world around us was uh, the, the world of the 1960s. You know, we, we ran up to school together. There was the same guy at the corner with the stop sign. We got to know him uh, and looked forward to seeing him every September, the year that there was someone else there. It was like we were all disoriented. There was a girl's side of the schoolyard which was paved so we could 
uh, skip rope and bounce balls and the boys side was gravel so that they could bleed and it would just sort of you know go into the ground or something like that um, and then there was a uh, grade three and fours it was like co-ed for the grade three and fours in the back of the school I don't know it was weird um, but the school was just up the street. You, had a, you each had a classroom. Um, you had a teacher for the whole year. There was no moving around. And I can remember uh, specialists coming in to teach us how to do um, ed exercises so that we would grow into strong Canadians. Didn't pay a lot of attention to that stuff at the time. But I remember my father being very impressed because the person who came to do them uh, was the brother of some very famous hockey player. I have no idea who that was. Um, but one of the things that, um, that I have since learned uh, is that, I mean, just in the last year, I've learned that I have this thing called SDAM, which is Severely Deficient Autobiographical Memory. So I really don't have a lot of memories of my childhood. I just don't hold on to them. In fact, I, had no, I would have had no idea that I wrote that hymn. Uh, when we sang it doesn't look familiar to me at all someone came up to me one time and said something to me and I said oh, it was at a speech I was giving and, and and I said oh that's very clever and he goes it's from your book <laughs> mortified absolutely mortified anyhow so I don't have a lot of uh, stories from when I was a child right I just have perceptions of what it was like right so and it was it was the typical growing up um, our family was lucky. We had a big house. We had a mom who stayed home. We had a father who brought home money. Um, and the only thing that we really compared it to, the only, only situation that I considered uh, wasn't the same as mine, was um, two children who had been uh, adopted during the 60s scoop of Indigenous children and who, uh, whose bedroom was pretty much the size of my bed. Um, and had been set apart in their house for them to have that. And I remember thinking that that was appalling. I was stunned by that. But other than that, everything was great, right? When I went to university, I remember phoning my parents. Um, I was in a religion and culture class, and we were talking about families and what families were like, and, and people were talking about what their upbringing had been like. And I phoned my parents, and I said, I just want to tell you, you are the best parents ever. Because I was being exposed to stories that completely shocked me, that things like that happened in families was appalling and disturbing and disrupted my entire worldview. And so my safe little home seemed to be this idyllic childhood in which I grew up. And I was grateful for that. So I phoned my parents and I told them how grateful I was uh, for that. Uh, they reminded me of that several times, which is why I remember that. Uh, so your reflection on your family when you're growing up is one thing when you're a young adult and you, and you learn about other people, that's a different thing, and then you go to therapy. And it's a whole different story, because that's when the anthropological dig really starts happening, right? When you really start learning about yourself. And so you reflect on things that you've really known all along, but you start linking them together with other things so that they make sense. Same thing as finding out that the roots of our language pop up in the roots of several other languages somewhere else. You don't really know that until you start looking, right? And so you start looking at your family and all of these things start showing up, right? So, so here's a story about some of the things I found. My mom was brilliant. She did, went, she did nursing at Queen's University. She got the gold A. I know that because I was told that. I did a search on the gold A, couldn't find anything out about it, but I think it was the highest mark in Queen's for that year. So she was a registered nurse. She called up sick kids in Toronto, said, uh, do you need someone? And they said, we'll start tomorrow. So she showed up. She worked in Toronto for some time, um, was engaged to be married. My grandmother said, if you marry that person, who she said was, uh, I don't know, Jewish or something, I think he was Polish, uh, you will never see me again. And so mom broke that off, came back to Kingston because she had been invited by the head of the hospital in Kingston to open up the children's wing. It had been built, but there was nothing in it, nothing at all. And so mom put it together from the beds and the bed pans and the medications and the staff to make an entire uh, hospital for sick kids 
uh, which functioned in, in uh, Kingston. So she was brilliant. But when she came back to Kingston to do that, she ran into my dad again. They had dated for a while in university, and then she had dumped him when he had come to a, an event and was up in the balcony with a keg of booze over his shoulder, drinking it, uh, and entirely drunk, and she refused to ever see him again. But, you know, maybe they had matured a little bit, and she started dating him, and, of course, they got married. So here's what happened. Mom got married. She got pregnant. She had a baby. She got pregnant. She, had, she lost that baby, she got pregnant. She had a baby, she got pregnant. She had a baby, got pregnant, and had a baby. Five pregnancies in four years, five children, four children under the age of five. And some kind of miracle took place because she, or some technology thing happened, because she didn't get pregnant anymore, uh, which was a good thing. My father was still in the Navy when he started impregnating my mother and disappeared for long periods of time. My mother, this brilliant mind, was stuck at home with all these children under the age of five uh, and could barely cope. And so when I look back at that, and I understand, I used to tease my mom about some medication she used to take, and she finally took me aside and said, would you please stop telling people that I took that medication? But she was taking that medication because she could not cope with her life the way it was. She was screaming mad about how her life had turned out. Her mother, when mom told her what her due date was for her first child, booked a three-month trip to Europe because she wanted nothing to do with it uh, and, and provided absolutely no help. And my father's mother was completely unable to do anything. Um, once we all got to school, uh, she started working in a, in a daycare for underprivileged children, uh, then went and got a, uh, her certificate in teaching, ended up teaching uh, in the community college for 20 years, uh, and, and really found her place and shone in her career. My dad was also brilliant, uh, absolutely ridiculously smart man. Um, when he was 11, his father died. And his mother, who was a businesswoman, uh, she used the insurance to buy her first apartment building, which she could make money with, and that became the story of the family, was making money through real estate. Uh, but she remarried, uh, and the person that she married was horrifically brutal to my father. And so my father uh, lived with that and was constantly seeking to find ways to get the approval from that person that he had got from his father, and he never did find it. And so he, was, uh, he had some form, I assume, we assume, of nar a narcissistic disorder, maybe, um, that started at that point in time. He was totally absent as a father. At one point, we made jokes that uh, instead of assigning anyone to, make, to write his eulogy when, at the time when he died, we would just put microphones around the house, and we could record everything that he said about himself and use that. That was as the, the extremity of his own, his inability to speak about anything about himself. When he died, uh, he became a very brilliant local politician and influenced uh, Kingston in many, many ways, uh, which continue to affect the community in a very positive way now. Um, but when he died, uh, in, his, in his wall, it was a rec report card found from Regiopolis uh, High School, which is in Kingston. It was a boarding school, but Dad probably lived within walking distance of it. Uh, but he was boarded there. And in the report card, it shows that his marks weren't very well, but the priest had written on the back of it, it was Catholic, the priest had written on the back of it, I don't know why George is here. I expect it's to keep him out of the way. That had been in his wallet his whole life. So while I was in therapy, I made this little sign which Scott hides whenever someone visits the house because I, I said it in therapy and my therapist said it back to me and I thought, oh my gosh, that's true. And I have this like really crazy font called Angelic Warfare. So it's written in Angelic Warfare and it says, we were wild children trying, to trying our best to raise ourselves and we did a shitty job of it. It took me well into my 60s to figure all of that out. But I now have a pretty good understanding. 
about why so many things, why I react to so many things in so many different ways, and how I might have done so many different things better, might have actually salvaged one of my previous marriages and not even be here with this man at this point in time, but that's hardly worth it. <laughs> Happy to have got where I am now. But this isn't all about me. I mean, I'm not wanting this to be all about me. I'm wanting this to be an anthropological dig for all of us. Because we always have to have work to do. And so now I'm going to talk about you as a community and the anthropological dig that you are challenged to do in this time and place now because you are at a crux where you can completely collapse as I was about to do or you can learn a little bit more about who you are and who you want to be and what the roots of who you are have been and how you can stand on them with dignity and with courage and speak about who you are. I have, over time, spoken about your history. A lot of it is pretty straightforward. Uh, you grew out of the United Church of Canada at a time when, um, you know, the neighborhood was growing. Um, all, there were lots of men who wanted to be involved in church. There were lots of women who wanted to get together for social events because they were raising four and five children at the time, too, and needed some kind of social support for that. Um, you had all kinds of uh, children growing into a, a church school. This was a tiny church. These were the outer walls of the church at that point in time. Um, I remember uh, Phil Spencer, who, who became a diaconal minister one time, telling me that she had met one of the other members of the congregation. I can't remember who it was, but they had met and become fast friends cleaning out the pit toilets uh, of the church uh, when they were members early on. So there was a lot of community happening as that church came together, uh, couples meeting each other, uh, families growing up together, going to the same school, bonding with one another. And so in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, it was a pretty typical United Church, strong music program, um, uh, and it was program oriented. It was completely self-sufficient financially, and you had a variety of different ministers that went from uh, sort of the sort of Early, the earliest one I know is Chauncey McKay, who was a fairly conservative minister, and then Fred Stiles came, and half the congregation left and went to another church because he was the liberal minister. And then um, ta ta um, Tom Gilchrist came back, he was more conservative, so they came back again. And then Bruce Sanguine came, and he was liberal but very progressive and, and dynamic, and so he held on to people, and then, um, and then I came. But during the 1980s and 90s, um, oops, I've gone backwards. During the 1980s and 90s, uh, the, the neighborhood development kind of slowed. Like when you have the build of a, I learned, I sort of became aware of this when my son was a child and they, were, they built a new school for the subdivision, but it was too small for the number of kids they had. They had to put all these portables outside of it. I said, why didn't you just build it big enough? And they said, because the number of kids that are going to be in it are only going to be here for like, you know, six or seven years. And then the number of young kids in this community is going to drop off to nothing because these families are gonna have grown and new families are not gonna be coming in. So the same thing was happening around here. In the 1980s and 1990s, the number of kids had sort of stabilized. The number of communities, uh, I mean the whole uh, West Rouge area was yet to be developed, but the numbers had really kind of stabilized and so the congregation had stabilized as well. Um, it re uh, men remained predominantly in leadership. Uh, there was strong leadership by women in the, in the church school. Interest in an innovative worship, that was Fred Stiles' uh, guitar worship, which, which took place in the 1970s and was what forced most people to go to another congregation. Um, there was an exploration of contemporary scholarship um, uh, that, that was welcomed by some people and not so much by others. Uh, financial challenges sort of start appearing. Um, when I arrived in uh, 1997, I learned that the congregation was going to close almost immediately because <laughs> there was absolutely no money. Of course, we hadn't told anybody that there was absolutely no money, so we'd actually raised all the money that we needed by the end of the year, and we found ourselves in a, in a positive financial situation. But the, it, that, was, that was a precursor to what was happening. Churches 
anywhere were no longer flush United Churches and they were starting to rent out space they were starting to look for other ways to support their ministries uh, we welcomed contemporary church school materi material uh, the whole people of God uh, came out and it had some very progressive church school stuff in it but church school numbers began to decline as the children aged and there weren't a lot of young children uh, coming out until again that West Rouge area which wasn't developed to begin with because there was no bridge um, that started developing so there were fewer families with children then in the 2000s and to 2010s it starts becoming difficult to recruit leadership you just you didn't have leaders who really wanted to come forward and take on the role of board chair uh, or fill the different committees you reorganized your structure early in in i think it was 2005 or something that the organization of the congregation was restructured so that you had different ministries you called them different ministries and you had someone responsible for each of those ministries around the table um, you rewrote uh, who you wanted to be that um, i've talked about that stake in the ground uh, that one of the members of the congregation said, I'm not, we don't want to go back to that conservative theology. We want to stay here. And so that stake in the ground got put there. And you wrote the document that eventually uh, became kind of vision works, uh, began talking about uh, how you wanted to be rather than what you believed. Um, financial challenges became absolutely the norm. Um, and, and intentional innovations in congregational structure and in the Sunday service uh, took place. The book study, which had been going uh, since uh, 1992 or 93, I think, that book study went until about the maybe 2008, 2009, and then it uh, kind of crumbled under a single leadership rather than a shared leadership. Uh, and so the process changed, so that kind of came apart. And then there was this incredible uh, exodus of membership to another congregation shortly after my book was uh, was um, published and uh, more significant was the removal of uh, the Lord's Prayer from the service uh, which had become an issue which became sort of the, 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 the issue for people and we carried on and uh, then um, a uh, rule for heresy was created by the United Church and I went through a heresy trial. Uh, this is what I was wearing. This is the stole uh, which the first Roman Catholic women priests were ordained with uh, on a body of water in Ireland uh, because they had to do it on bodies of water. We subsequently had an ordination, an ordination of Roman Catholic women priests here uh, in the community here um, sometime later than that. So the, the questions are, what happened with all the trauma? Where did that trauma go? I mean, I went to therapy and I mined it. But where did the trauma of being West Hill go and how have we dealt with that? Have we actually grounded it in our decisions going forward? Are we aware of it? Have we got like, have we got a chip on our shoulder and so we're doing it, you know, come hell or high water? Or have we processed it to the point that we can rest in the truth of who we are and make those decisions going forward? Have we got to the point where we can look at our heritage and say, some of that was just bloody crazy. And we've been trying to raise ourselves and we've been doing the best we can but is it everything we can do i'm incredibly proud of what the congregation has done over the last uh, period of time i mean the the during the three months that sarah was here as your um, pastoral charge supervisor you put together an opportunity to create a new vision now I don't know whether you went into your past and dug through some of that stuff and acknowledged the pain of that, acknowledged the reality of dwindling numbers, acknowledged the, the difficulty it is to engage through Zoom, though having actually made your way to that platform was extraordinary. I don't know what led to that visioning program happening at the time, because I was, I was on leave, obviously. 
but you came up with this incredible idea. And I've spoken about it the last couple of Sundays I've spoken, and I think once before, that, that it's, it's unique. It's entirely something that we know the world out there needs. But the truth is it doesn't look like this. It doesn't feel like this. It isn't this. It has to be something else. And I know, Jean, you and your group struggle with this. What does it look like? And how do we make it that? How can we take that leap from being a group of people who, you know, gather in this space and have for years, and, and those online who are a tight-knit community because you gather together online, how do we take it to that new thing? And how do we let this go on the way there? Do we need to let it go? Or do, does this carry on in parallel and that operate over here? To be the anthropologist simply means to look at who you are, to understand um, what that is. One of the, one of the readings said, will the, re will the reading, will the future be your future? This is what I get from the Sandberg reading. Will the future be your future? Or will the future be your diversions? West Hills history has been a number of diversions since 2004, when we created a vision works document that set us apart from other communities. And then the word of that got out. And then we were rejected when we went to presbytery with proposals for money. And then, and then my book came out and there was, well, that came out first and there was all of the publicity around that. And then there was the heresy trial and there was the challenges about that. And where do we stop being diverted from all of that stuff and find the time to sit with, oh, now I know who I am. Now I can figure out who I want to be, who I can be, and how I can make that happen. And that's your conversation past the anthropological review, sitting with the possibilities. Your work is figuring out how to go forward and know what is past and what is diversion and what is future into which you can step. Anthropology is a lot like therapy. It begins with a question. What is that? Then another. Why is it that? And another. Was it always that? Or did it become something from something else? From what? If it did, is it still becoming? Why? Are we good? Are we dangerous? or maybe just benign. Those are completely different questions. Easier to answer, harder. We just can't know. We are an evolution, a becoming. Possibilities exponentialized every second by the number of people in the room, around the table, in the conversation, willing to take the first step or simply jump.
Outcomes are never known. They're only ever measured later when the anthropologists arrive. Become a sustaining champion of West Hill United's work by committing to an automatic monthly donation. Learn more or donate now through Canada Helps.